To introduce uh, our first speaker, Senator John Glenn of Iowa. Iowa. I don't think I need to remind uh, this audience that he was the first American to orbit the Earth. Uh, it was on the 20th of February, 1962. I'm sure all of us remember it well. But now, as a political leader, he continues to span the globe with a very extensive knowledge uh, of nuclear non-proliferation challenges. Here in Congress, uh, and out with Congress, he's a relentless champion of stringent measures to contain the nuclear threat. The job is far from over, uh, and the world is very lucky to have a tireless crusader like Senator Glenn. He has also taken an unflinching look at the damage caused by the nuclear weapons production complex in the United States to the health of Americans and to their environment. And in fact, the production system is virtually shut down because of these problems. And a massive cleanup is now being planned. His own state, Iowa, is one of the hardest hit. So we know that he is close, very close to the problems. Senator Glenn, we are indeed very pleased to have you. And I invite you to address this session of Parliamentarians for Global Action. Senator John Glenn. Thank you. Thank you very much, and I am honored for the privilege of speaking before this distinguished audience today about a subject that is already indicated is close to my heart, and that is the problem of halting the global spread of nuclear weapons. And I've been working most of my Senate career, I guess, on one phase or another of this. Uh, started out when I first arrived here in 75, basically because uh, there wasn't much work going on in that particular area. And I was interested in it, so I uh, started work at that time. Uh, because your group is devoted to mobilizing parliamentarians around the world into action to address chronic global problems, I thought I would begin by describing how we got involved in this particular issue in the Senate and a few of the things that have happened through the years. I entered the Senate in 1975, but at that time the world was poised on the brink of a new wave of proliferation. India had just announced its so-called PNE, Peaceful Nuclear Explosion. Germany was concluding what was then called the nuclear deal of the century involving the export of an entire nuclear fuel cycle to Brazil. Although U.S. opposition to this sale was widely criticized throughout Europe as just another American extraterritorial attempt to enforce its own law in Europe, I think it is noteworthy that the Brazilian president just recently revealed the existence of a previously secret nuclear weapon program that began about the time this deal was concluded. Back in those days, France, meanwhile, was preparing to sell nuclear reprocessing technology to South Korea, Taiwan, Pakistan, and not wanting to be outsold, America was working up offers of nuclear reactors to Egypt and Israel. Pakistani leaders were talking of eating grass in order to acquire a bomb to balance India's capability. And after the Arab-Israeli War in 1973 and subsequent energy crisis, President Nixon and other leaders in Europe and Japan pressed ahead with their ill-advised plans to make large-scale commercial uses of plutonium, which of course is a deadly carcinogen and fissile component of nuclear weapons. Now, all of those combine to give me an interest in this, but my primary interest in stopping the flow of nuclear weaponry around the world more than anything else was the fact that I have personally been through two wars, World War II and Korea, in a very active combat role. And I know what happens in regular conventional war. And knowing how much terror and horror that brings, I just can heart, it's almost mind-boggling to think what would occur if we had a war like that and it went nuclear. And that led me more than anything else into, into looking into some of these matters. As I said before, not much was being done in this particular area. On nuclear non-proliferation, it's so highly technical that 
as we used to joke in my office, it's a MEGO item, M-E-G-O, my eyes glaze over when you bring up the subject. And since some two-thirds of the Congress here are normally lawyers in any given particular time, uh, there wasn't that much interest in amigo item like nuclear nonproliferation. But in such an environment, I thought it was most important, in fact, it was imperative for the United States to tighten its controls over its own nuclear exports, and above all, raise the issue of nuclear nonproliferation on our agenda of national priorities. The, my, one of my first, I think it was my single first legislative thing that involved money on the floor of the Senate and treaty were inadequate to prevent diversion of nuclear materials for weapons purposes and to maintain physical security against terrorism. And my goal has always been to seek improvements in these safeguards, since any retreat to purely national or bilateral controls would only hasten the collapse of the global nonproliferation regime. In 1976 and 77, Congress moved to strengthen sanctions against countries that were illicitly building bombs or supplying bomb-related components and technology. We had uh, amendments that I put in with uh, Senator Symington. They became the Glenn Symington Amendments in 1977 to the Foreign Assistance Act, requiring the halt of all U.S. economic and military aid to any nation that engages in imports or exports of nuclear reprocessing or unsafeguarded uranium enrichment technology. 1978, we had the Nuclear Nonproliferation Act, which I put in, which required America's foreign nuclear customers to agree to full scope IAEA safeguards as a condition for nuclear cooperation. The new law also further tightened U.S. nuclear export controls and enhanced the powers of congressional oversight over such exports. It also mandated additional strict terms for the negotiation of new agreements for nuclear cooperation. Now, I'm pleased to see that both Germany and Japan now require their nuclear customers to have full-scope safeguards as a requirement for nuclear cooperation. And long last, Great Britain, too, finally announced just this week that it would apply that same standard. And I hope certainly that uh, France and the Soviet Union, Italy, Belgium, and other nations that export nuclear technology will soon follow suit. The tough export controls and a strong system of safeguards will not be sufficient to contain the forces of proliferation if there is not a greater demonstration by the existing nuclear weapon states, and I do not mean just the superpowers, to demonstrate their commitment to nuclear disarmament. It is clear, I also said back in that 1975 statement, that the have-not nations are increasingly looking at limitations on United States and Soviet atomic weaponry as a precondition for strict limitation on their own activities. Now, I believe then, as I believe now, that the nuclear weapon states have not done enough to satisfy their obligations under Article 6 of the NPT, to halt the nuclear arms race and to work for nuclear disarmament. Last year, in the Senate Intelligence Committee's official report on means to verify the threshold test ban and peaceful nuclear explosions treaties, I suggested in an attached statement that a CTB will go a long way toward reducing the threat of nuclear war and would also serve to enhance our nation's long-standing interest in preventing the proliferation of nuclear weapons to other nations. For these reasons, I have supported the notion of a low-yield threshold test ban treaty as a stepping stone to the ultimate goal of a comprehensive international ban on all nuclear explosions everywhere and for all time. And hopefully we'll be able to verify those, or I don't think there'll be such an agreement, but we need, so we need more work on that verification area. With respect to the proposal for a ban on the production of fissile nuclear materials for weapons uses, we addressed this issue in a statement added to the Senate Armed Services Committee's 1988 report on the INF Treaty. It was precedent-setting verification measures arranged under that treaty presented, and I said there that an ideal opportunity for the superpowers to take even greater steps 
in the arms control process by exploring the possibility of a verifiable ban on the production of weapons grade fissile material. I've also supported legislative efforts to require the administration to study the means to verify such a ban. Ultimately, I'd like to see the creation of a new world order that includes a ban on the production of all weapons grade fissile material, even for commercial uses. After all, we must remember that under current plans in Europe and Japan, plutonium will be commercially separated, stored, and transported in quantities far beyond the volume that currently exists in either the Soviet or American nuclear arsenals. There is, however, no consensus within our government on what to do about these problems. First, by granting blanket long-term consent rights for certain countries in Europe and Japan to use U.S. nuclear materials and technology for the production of bomb-grade nuclear fuels for commercial uses, our government is only bringing the day closer when some of that material will almost inevitably wind up in the hands of a terrorist group or via black market and illicit nuclear weapons program. Second, some within the administration now appear to believe that horizontal nuclear proliferation is a new rationale for vertical proliferation. In congressional testimony on June 12th of last year, <clears throat> for example, the Secretary of Defense cited the growing proliferation of weapons of mass destruction and sophisticated weapons technology in the third world as another reason for maintaining our strategic deterrent. Similarly, the Secretary of Energy stated in his January of 1991 report on the reconfiguration of the nuclear weapons complex that because of the global threat of proliferation, fundamental changes in the design and material processes used in the production of nuclear weapons may be required. How ironic it would be if nuclear weapons will be called upon in this much heralded New World Order as an instrument of non-proliferation. Another issue that's finally receiving some attention in this country concerns the serious environmental problems that have resulted from our efforts over the last half century to produce nuclear weapons. My capacity as chairman of the Governmental Affairs Committee have had a series of investigations into the enormous health and safety and environmental problems associated with the production of fissile materials for such nuclear weapons. In looking at the estimated $150 billion price tag for cleaning up our nuclear weapons facilities over what's estimated to be the next 30 years, I hope that any other nations that may be thinking about pursuing their nuclear options will fully consider the human and environmental costs that will incur by choosing such an ill-advised course. The decade of the 1980s was, in my opinion, a time of troubles for the nuclear nonproliferation regime. First, America continued to provide billions of dollars in economic and military aid to Pakistan, despite its bomb, continuing bomb program. Though not unique to the United States, this is a practice that's come to be called, I would say, turning a blind eye to proliferation. And second, although Israel's attack in 1981 on Iraq's safeguarded research reactor was clearly a vote of no confidence in the integrity and reliability of international safeguards, the international community preferred to focus its condemnation on Israel rather than to address the weaknesses of safeguards which had only encouraged the attack. Indeed, a decade later, the IAEA failed to detect on a timely basis that Iraq had violated safeguards commitments under the NPT. The positive achievements of the last decade, including the expansion of membership in the NPT and the creation of a series of gentlemen's agreements regarding conditions for exporting nuclear and missile technology, fall short of counterbalancing the setbacks of that period. America gave up its efforts to discourage its friends in Europe and Japan from large-scale commercial uses of plutonium and all but abandoned the goal of eliminating exports of highly enriched uranium for use in research reactors. 
U.S. supercomputers and other sensitive dual-use goods were approved for export to countries that were not parties to the NPT. Iraq's secret nuclear pursuits have called into question the effectiveness of national export controls and have shaken international confidence in IAEA safeguards, while the world community continued to expect the IAEA to handle growing responsibilities with a zero-growth budget. And the world impatiently awaits the conclusion of additional steps by all the nuclear weapon states to reduce their nuclear arsenals. I would say that I'm a big fan of IEA. I think if we didn't have IEA, we would have to invent it and support it. But we haven't given it enough support, in my view. And I believe we're also entering a particular time period where IAEA or a similar organization is going to have to also come to grips with the spreading weapons of biological and chemical nature, which in some respects have been called the poor nation's nukes because they can be just as devastating as weapons of mass destruction. They're very easy to put together. The formulas are known and compared to a whole nuclear program, chemical and biological weapons are are far more difficult to detect and to deal with, but with some of the advances we see coming up, maybe every bit as devastating as, uh, as nuclear weapons have been. So I think we're going to have to get into looking at those as we go ahead now, and perhaps that can come under IEEA or some similar organization. Now as to our current congressional activities, in the climate after the war in Iraq, Congress is clearly inclined to resume its activist role in attacking the global problems of nuclear proliferation and I believe chemical and biological proliferation also. Because over the last two years, Congress passed a ban on U.S. imports and U.S. government contracts with foreign companies that help other nations to acquire chemical and biological weapons or the missiles to deliver them. And I've introduced legislation this year to extend this ban to the field of illicit nuclear commerce and to certain activities of American companies as well. The bill would also substantially widen the U.S. President's authority to seize assets in the United States of firms that promote nuclear proliferation. Other legislation has been introduced by my colleagues in the House and Senate that would tighten U.S. nuclear export controls even further to require nations that import U.S. dual-use nuclear goods to agree to full-scope IAEA safeguards as a condition for supply. In the near future, I plan to put in legislation which uh, is still being worked over right now, but we hope it will identify uh, some 20 different proposals for actions by the United States that would help strengthen IAEA, help strengthen safeguards in the global non-proliferation -prolifer regime. These proposals uh, are far-reaching and, if adopted, I think would result in a substantial enhancement of the authority of the IEA to perform its safeguards responsibilities. I'm well aware that legislation in any one nation state cannot be expected to solve the global problems of nuclear proliferation. I'm a strong supporter of collective international action to address this problem because it is a worldwide problem. And in the old world order, the primary responsibility of coordinating the international effort to halt nuclear proliferation fell usually to professional, national, and international bureaucrats who preferred to conduct their exchanges in private. And I hope we can look forward and see a day, however, when there will be additional forms of international cooperation to halt the global spread of weapons of mass destruction. Although I do not intend today to outline my own personal interpretation of the President's use of the phrase, New World Order, I would submit that there is a compelling need for greater international communication on a level other than the level of the professional bureaucrat. The official conduct of foreign relations is and will remain, of course, a solemn responsibility of the executives of our nations and I am not in any way advocating the displacement of that responsibility by our legislatures. But our legislatures have two essential missions which will be increasingly important as the world slowly evolves through the unstable times that lie ahead. And the first is oversight. 
In both supplier and consumer nations alike, we must ensure that the bureaucracies that are responsible for regulating foreign nuclear commerce are watched very closely by the legislatures and by the public at large, both. We must work toward fundamental reforms in each of our nations to open up for public examination the whole process in which such commerce is authorized. I firmly believe that if our national publics had greater access to data on the dangerous nuclear weapon related commodities that are approved for export, there would be a stronger political foundation for restraining such exports. In short, we must work to end the current practice that we all recognize in each of our nations of treating commercial export control data and information as though they were military secrets. It is possible to protect legitimate proprietary commercial information without entirely excluding the public from the extremely important roles of review and oversight. When it comes to sound legislation, there is just no substitute for a well-informed legislature. And this is true regardless of whether the issue is national or global. And there are many ways to accomplish this. Back in 1975, for example, uh, the Government Operations Committee, now called Governmental Affairs Committee, on which I served and which I now chair, issued a 1,400-page reader on entitled Peaceful Nuclear Exports and Weapons Proliferation to assist people in the Congress and their staffs in gaining background on these issues. So it would move out of that, that MIGO category I mentioned over, where eyes seem to glaze over when you bring up matters involving nonproliferation. And over the years, I've chaired and participated in dozens of public hearings on nuclear proliferation issues. But keeping some 535 members of Congress up to date on worldwide proliferation developments has been a continuing challenge. Last year, uh, our Governmental Affairs Committee started putting out a newsletter called Proliferation Watch. I have some copies of it uh, here with me this morning and be glad to give uh, some of those to you. Some of you may have copies of that. It started out as sort of an experiment to, to collate, bring together all the information out of international press and so on that, uh, regarding what the situation was with regarding uh, proliferation at the moment and sort of keep up with it on a continuing basis as sort of a uh, giving a bibliography of sources that would be of use to people that were involved in the community. Its object was to make a, a twin effort to keep members better informed and to raise the priority of non-proliferation as a policy issue. The second challenge all of us will face in the years ahead will be to improve the lines of communications between our legislatures. Meetings like this one today between parliamentarians who share common convictions on the need to address global problems need to occur more frequently. I hope that someday we'll be able to follow parliamentary debates in our nations and internationally much more closely than they're followed today. Here on Capitol Hill, we have an online information system that indexes all congressional debates. The debates in all our legislatures must be more readily accessible, perhaps by means of a similar system of computer indexing. I hope someday to see activist members of other legislatures holding hearings and issuing their own publications, perhaps even uh, your own versions of a newsletter like this proliferation watch that we put out here, which will help educate other members of parliaments about the threat of proliferation and the need for collective actions to address that, that threat. Yes, we probably are facing the advent of a new world order. But it's always been thus, I guess, because there is always change and things are always evolving, and so we're moving to a new world order continually. But whether the phrase becomes an empty foreign policy slogan or a rallying point for unprecedented international cooperation to address global problems may well be determined less by the fate of the secret diplomacy than something more profound, the level of international communication between legislators and informed public opinion in our respective nations. People are now far more informed around the world, as we witnessed just from CNN during the Iraq War, when we actually shared around the world people watched missiles going by the hotel in Iraq. 
And it was general public. This was not just for the diplomats, it was the general public. And so the day when only the few, the informed, the elite, the leaders, the bureaucrats were sufficiently knowledgeable to make decisions or to negotiate, usually in secret, on behalf of the unknowing public, may be in the process of being replaced by informed public opinion that will demand action because our problems are global. And just perhaps that new world order will come to be not a grand design from above, but a demand from below. Echoing several of Woodrow Wilson's famous 14 points for a post-war peace after World War I, U.S. officials talk today of a new world order based on democracy, the rule of law, and the value of world opinion. Yet also like Woodrow Wilson, perhaps, these officials may not have paid enough attention to the roles that the national legislatures play in achieving this new order. I think this is an unfortunate oversight since legislatures are precisely those institutions that were created to register public opinion. Were created to write the laws, created to defend the democratic ideal. And to neglect the legislatures is to neglect what may be a central pillar of the new order, a lesson that President Wilson learned the hard way. And I believe that such treatment of the legislatures reflects an old world view that world affairs are the exclusive domain of the foreign policy specialists and the bu bureaucracy, the same people that have time and again proven unable to cope with global problems of world hunger, of world war, and world peace. But however well-intentioned proposals for a new world order, uh, for new world orders will not succeed unless they have legitimacy in the eyes of world public opinion. And I cannot see how legitimacy can be achieved and maintained without involving the legislatures. Ultimately, the surest way to halt nuclear proliferation is to strengthen public opinion in all nations against, and the chemical and biological along with it against the possession of such weapons and the achievement of this goal will also require an active role by the legislatures. I'd like to say in closing that I noticed a quote that appeared in one of the brochures published by the Parliamentarians for Global Action. It's in that little blue back brochure that I'm sure is in your folders. It was a remark made in 1948 by Fred Hoyle who said, and I quote, once a photograph of the earth is taken from the outside, a new idea as powerful as any in history will be let loose. Well, I know a little bit about that because I've been there and I've been fortunate enough to be able to take some of those pictures. I must admit the view is indeed just as inspiring as, as Hoyle thought it might be. I don't know of anybody that's been up there in space that doesn't come back impressed with the fact that we must live here on planet Earth, which doesn't look quite as large to us as it did back in days past. And we see the beauty of this place. We see the fragility of our environment, the fragility and successes of some nations in grappling with problems can usefully be shared with other nations that are confronting those same concerns. And I hope that my own experiences that I've just briefly alluded to here today in addressing some of these problems within our own government may uh, help you uh, in, in some of your efforts in your own particular countries also, even though uh, there are certainly differences that exist in our forms of government. It's perhaps noteworthy that the two mottos that appear on the great seal of the United States, Novus Ordo Seclorum, which means new order of the ages, along with e pluribus unum, out of many, one, show our national commitment to collective approaches to problem solving and our determination to build a better world for future generations. So I salute the efforts of your organization to accomplish both of these objectives. I wish you well in your pursuits and we look forward to working with you in what's a common goal for all of us. Thank you. Senator Glenn, you uh, will see by the reaction of the audience how much they appreciate uh, what you've said. 
I would like to endorse that and echo uh, the thanks to you for setting the scene in such a comprehensive, authoritative, but above all committed way. We are most grateful to you. Now we know that you have other commitments within this uh, US Senate and we do appreciate uh, the time you've taken and the fact that you now have to leave us. Uh, we wish you well in all your efforts in the US Senate in this field and thank you very much again for all that you've said to us.